dealing with too much information, but I thought that I would bring more than I probably need to share, and you can go at whatever pace, and since it's a very experienced group, um, then we could just uh, set the pace however we like to. Uh, I will talk, um, I will talk about a few myths in second language acquisition that are applicable not only to adult learners, but to children's learners as well. To begin with, just some, some myths in second language acquisition, then I'll talk about, I'll do a little brief history of the different um, methodologies that we've had um, ever since languages were officially taught or there was an official methodology, but it's gonna be a very brief historical um, background. And then I'll just talk about practical issues that we we may encounter in the classroom and hopefully we could do a little bit of, uh, um, maybe we could create some activities or transform activities or sometimes bound by editorial, um, I'm going to start already criticizing the publishers, right? Uh, but sometimes, um, because I've, I've been in contact with them many times and they say, oh, that's a wonderful idea, but we're not going to publish that because it doesn't sell. So sometimes what we find in the books is not necessarily, in the textbooks, is not necessarily the most um, updated information that they have about language learning. So we'll criticize them a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, I'm just going to share some, um, some myths in second language acquisition, and, um, and then you guys can tell me if you think it's true or not. Um, adults learn, learn second languages more quickly and easily than young children. What do you think? False. Um, actually, it's true. Yeah, true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, it's true because, well, it, you know, it could be both. Um, children need less language. So that's why sometimes it, there's this misconception that children learn uh, faster, but they sometimes they need a lot less to, to get by. But the truth is that um, adults have more cognitive, more strategies, more ability, more memory, more, more capacity, and kids don't, don't do that. So it's, it's a very common misconception, and there's plenty of research to prove that. Uh, then another one is, according to research, uh, students in uh, English as a second language only programs with no schooling in their native language take seven to 10 years to reach grade level norms. And this is, um, I don't know what your input would be, I can ask you or not, but it's, uh, it's, um, it's also true. So it can take them about that much. Uh, myth number three is that a lot of immigrant children have learning disabilities, not language problems. And they speak English just fine, but they're still failing academically. This would be perfect. Yeah, this is, this is false. It's just a language but sometimes they're isolated, and, and this applies to um, adults as well. Older generations of immigrants learn uh, without all the special language programs that immigrant children receive now, and uh, it was a sink or swim, and they just did fine. True. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true, but they didn't do fine. They struggled sometimes, too. Yeah. So, you know, um, they survived, and everybody has their own ways of, of coping, but um, when it comes to the actual language, they, they also had a, a difficult time. Uh, second language learners will acquire academic English faster if their parents speak English at home. That could be true. It's yeah. also false. It's also <laughs> false because it's better to be literate in yeah. the first language. Yeah. And then you can transfer the skills to the second language easier. It's easier to transfer skills than it is to, to learn the skill. So, you know, if you are um, Arabic at home, and then you say, you know, we're moving to the United States, we're all gonna speak English at home. Sometimes that's erroneous, because it's better to just to keep speaking Arabic at home. Yeah. And then you become really, all the nuances, and, all, and then you become really proficient in your, in your first language. And then you can always transfer those skills to the second language, just like reading uh, and, and writing. If you learn how to read and write, and this is, uh, I don't know if you guys have these problems, we have these problems at USCB. Sometimes we get students that come from, uh, from uh, especially, Latin American countries, and they speak Spanish really well, but they don't know how to read or write. And, uh, and if they have learned how to read or write in English, then they do fine, but if not, it's really, really challenging. Because they, they speak it really well, but each skill develops on its own. So as you'll notice, the four skills of like oral, um, writing, reading, and listening, they just develop independently. I mean, they're, they're, connect, they're connected, but uh, that's why sometimes you think, oh, this is the, the most difficult one, but the truth is, it doesn't matter how much you read, you're not gonna learn to speak by reading. That's, that's um, the reality of it. Um, I was in sec. Uh, the more time students spend soaking up English in the mainstream classroom, the more, the, the, the quicker, the more quickly, oh, sorry, the more quickly they will learn the language. Any 
<laughs> Nobody says anything anymore. True. So. <laughs> it's true. It seems like it would be true. Yeah, and this one it this one is true. English in the in the mainstream classroom can also help. However, um, again, strategies. There's also you know uh, strategies to learn uh, can help um, with uh, assisting assisting them with the in scaffolding and doing things in the in the first language as well. Once students can speak English, they are ready to undertake undertake the academic tasks. Uh, of a mainstream classroom is in me the, the, the other mm -hmm. uh, and this is this is in default and it's a little, it ties up a little bit with what I mentioned before what they call the BICs the basic interpersonal communication skills uh, those are acquired fast faster and sooner than the CALP the cognitive academic language proficiency skills uh, the CALP is something that you learn in an academic environment so we Sometimes we assume that our students know certain things or certain logistics that you do in the classroom, like you know, open the page, go to yada yada, and, and they learn that in the classroom. But it, and they also learn to to write in an academic way or to speak that academically in the academic setting. So this is not something that they're going to bring from the house because this is just the same as the students learning English in um, in literature. Um, it, it's what we would learn as well. So it's learned in a classroom environment, but it's it's to people like us. So that, as opposed to like English for academic purposes or Spanish for academic purposes, like I see math in second language. And it's exactly what they're teaching. But this seems like it has behaviors in it as well, right? So it's not just like written English it's, for academic It's written, language. oral, it, it's all, it, it applies to all the, all the language skills. Yes, yes. Um, and oftentimes it has to do with critical thinking, analytical skills as well. So if that's what you mean by behavior, then yes. Oh no, but also like the process of, you know, you get into class and you open the book and you go yeah. to this page and you do that. That's a behavior that you learn in the classroom yes. as opposed to the difference between the way you write a letter to your friend and then the way you write a letter yeah. in an academic setting, which are very different. Yes, register, what we normally know as register exactly. and all that. Yes, this is learned. Um, this is not something that they can learn out of, outside of the academic classroom or the, the academic setting. So yes, we're responsible for, for that kind of thing in any language. Um, cognitive and academic development in native language has an important positive effect on second language acquisition. And this is true, obviously, yes. And the culture of students doesn't affect how, it, how long it takes them to acquire English. All students learn languages the same way. And this is false. Yes, this mm -hmm. is false. So um, it really depends on their background, and this applies to even um, what we think is a homogeneous population. As we all know, we have different ways of processing languages, and uh, so it doesn't occur, uh, it doesn't always occur the same way, of course. Um, so this was about the myths, and, and now I was going to talk a little bit, as I said, about the, the chronology of methods and the communicative approach, uh, what research tells us, the practice practical implications in second language acquisition, which is these activities, um, Spanish only, um, um, I should have written uh, second language acquisition only, sorry, or um, second language only in the classroom and grammatical explanation. Um, so I'm gonna start with the chronology of methods, because I thought I said that there's a lot of information here. Mm -hmm. But uh, pretty much uh, Skinner, um, out of the realm of psychology, I'm sure many of you know, uh, uh, action response or, or behavior response. Um, uh, we still uh, teach dogs how to do how, how to do things uh, thanks to Skinner. In uh, in a lot of the languages, they were uh, they were believed to be learned that way as well. So the more you repeat and you drill, eventually they get into your brain. And uh, and this is part of what this. I don't know. Maybe I I, I learned English that way. So it's not like you know you just mem memorize, 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 and you will learn. Is what my used to say and, um, and um, somehow it, it happened but it, it, many things happen at the same time. <laughs> so behaviorism, audiolingualism, um, uh, it came partly from behaviorism but it developed in military schools, the silent method, total physical response, rat based method, communicative language, th these are some of the very many approaches that we have nowadays. Communicative language teaching, content-based approach, culture-based approach, uh, task-based instruction, uh, those are all um, words that you may hear in language 
think that this is what we are trying to practice. I'm sorry, Mr. Um, I know you're trying to go, oh, you're going to go into it? I, yeah, a little bit, yeah. as long as you want to, as long as you're interested, but I, I, I was not going to spend too much time, but... Uh, well, yeah, I just, yeah, I just want to know what they are. Yes, then if you do want to know what they are, then I will go into detail. If not, I'm just going to skip through them, but... So behaviorism um, has to do with habit formation, repetition. The teacher's always, you know, here, which is my... I have a little bit of a, of a you know, of a accordance to that position, but sometimes we do have habits. So the instructor, so there's always this image of the teacher in the middle of the classroom and the arrows always go in that direction. So I am the source, I'm, I'm, I'm the knowledge, and I'm the one who provides the knowledge. And then there's drills, translation, there was no communication among the students, and there was no peer work, no group work. So this, um, this was still practiced in a lot of um, uh, countries um, recently. Um, you just sit, you don't open your mouth ever if you learn a language. The language is taught in the, in the first language, so you learn all the rules of the language. You do a little bit of reading, perhaps. And um, so this was, um, this happened for many, many, many years. And this is where what we call traditional, um, traditional methodologies um, started. And, and, um, and it, you know, to a certain extent, it, it, it has some impact because you, when you spend so much time doing something, um, so, some things do stick. I remember still passages from when I was in, you know, junior high school uh, about the author and having a British teacher. <laughs> so uh, and, and they, they made us repeat the same thing over and over about <laughs> as an author and whatnot. And uh, so, I mean, I guess it's like some prayers, you know, you can memorize them. But I don't know that I would be able to make any sense um, out of those set phrases. So this is about behaviorism. And then, soon after, soon after that, and, uh, with the military schools, with the war, with the spies, they needed they realized that they needed to talk sometimes. People really needed to use languages in a more, um, in a more, in a, in an oral way. So then that's why they call this the audio lingual and audio lingualism. So the teacher is still the central figure and the source of knowledge, and it moved from the grammar uh, in text translation. That's what they used to do in traditional grammar to something a little bit more oral. So they did, um, they did listen and they did, they, but they still repeated a lot. And uh, so we have repetition, imitation, reinforcement. And, and there was this idea that your, your, the habits that you have in your first language interfere with the second language. Mm -hmm. So the best way that you can avoid that is just repeating, repeating, repeating. And um, our instructors are pretty much uh, drill teachers. This is still in a lot of the textbooks that we find a lot. Because this is how many of us learn how to how to um, how learn languages, and there's also this misconception as well that you know the way I learn languages, the right way to learn, to learn the languages. And I'm not saying that you don't learn, you know. And of course, anything that I say here is my personal opinion about languages and, and what I have studied. And I, I my dissertation was in second language education, and uh, but you know everybody's different tested. And um, what I try to do is is find the research that has to do or the research that normally shows us if things work or don't work, but sometimes research isn't always 100% effective either. So, you know, um, and, and everybody can form their own opinion. Um, I will not really get to conclusions yet, but this is audio lingualism. So this time they did listen to a lot of stuff because, you know, they had the spies, so they come in a room and they just, for eight hours, they needed to repeat things, so sit and just repeat, repeat, repeat. And there are programs like Rosetta Stone and other programs that we still, that, they, that are still, um, Cell that has to do with um, you say something and either you repeat and the computer will automatically tell you if you're saying something right or wrong and it has to do with pronunciation. And um, it's effective for pronunciation, but for learning itself, um, you know, it's, it's questionable is what research says. So this is just an example of um, a typical activity. To eat, I don't want to eat. And then, you know, what do you do with the next verb? To drink. And then Dance. I don't want to dance. To draw. Uh, so then, if you have a verb like to wear those yellows, all you have to do is write. Even if you do, if you even if you don't understand what you're saying, you just have to do I don't want to wear those yellows. <laughs> um, because clearly, um, it, the the idea of not having to understand what you're what you're doing is is behind this. 
And then these are just some of the methods that didn't last very long, but um, <laughs> are there, like the silent method. The silent method was taught, you know, the instructor would see it, they, they had a blackboard and they had rods, col um, colored rods, and then they would just write something on the board, for example, and then they would start giving you, you know, change a rod, and then you say something. Maybe say one thing, like, you know, uh, red. And then the instructor never said anything, so there were only a few sentences, and then they, do, they would just practice. It was the opposite of the grammar. I mean, it was somehow people were trying to find new ways of teaching um, languages or do something that was more um, um, effective or more creative, uh, but it didn't last very long. And then uh, total physical response, I'm sure that you have all um, uh, practiced it in class and heard about it, and um, it's still being used, and there are many modifications like PPRS, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and the Rathian method is the extreme of total physical response um, spatial commands. It's, um, it's still, research uh, says that it's still very effective uh, for early stages of language acquisition. So, because you can always just say, you know, you're using the second language always in the classroom, so that's always effective. And, um, and it's helpful for some, for some, you know, uh, uh, response to certain commands. And then you really know the students are understanding it because you say something that you've been um, asked upon. Rathias is a Greek uh, professor that was in, uh, is it Rathian? Oh, now I'm spacing out. Um, New Hampshire. Was he with the New Hampshire Party of Education? Anyway, it doesn't matter. But Rathias took TPR to the, uh, to the extreme. And, and he created, um, um, he, he acted out a lot of the teaching. There's some videos out there that you're welcome. I think that uh, Frank is releasing one of these videos yeah. of him in action. And, uh, and he became very famous, and they had a summer program. A lot of teachers in the 80s and the 90s went to, uh, to New Hampshire to just to, to do all kinds of workshops with him. And they were very effective, you know. He, but but it, it's for certain personalities, because not everybody, you really have to act out everything that you're saying. I remember him so, saying, like, he was almost like a clown. Totally. And, and, and I remember him saying that so many teachers maintain sort of a warped sense of dignity. I remember him saying something like that, and it made an impression because, like, like this this kind of dignified teacher up there, he says he he he, he totally uh, challenged that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and you really have to let go and and don't be afraid of you know of ridiculing yourself because you're just going to be out there and uh, you tell the students to create or we're going to go on a trip, and then you just use and then you use the entire classroom always. You're always moving, which is great for kinetic learners. But then, okay. This is a train, so he's like in the middle of the classroom. This is a train, so he grabs all kinds of chairs and come on, guys, get on the train. So he makes them all sit on the train. And what's this called? So it's always you're always moving, and uh, and then students sometimes really remember things because I don't know you. Uh, when I was learning languages, I had post-it notes all over my house. Uh, I've learned many languages because I'm a linguist, so sometimes you know I got confused between one another. So I had post-it notes all over my apartment in different languages. And just from seeing them in different places, mm -hmm. because I am probably a visual learner, um, I did remember, oh, that's the one in the bathroom. So then that one on the left, oh yeah, 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 that's la 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 in this language. And so he just really, but it's also not for every student, because not, uh, some students really are comfortable in their chairs and they don't want to say a word. <laughs> and and, um, and uh, he wants to break the whole anxiety. And uh, high, having high anxiety is terrible for language learning. But, um, but he really challenged it in a way that was just not effective for everyone. Davidson Community College, not Davidson Community, Davidson College, um, in 2004 I went there, and they were still using um, certain versions of the Autoratius method. So mm -hmm. sometimes they use a, these type of methods for the oral. Remember the lab? There used to be a language lab. I don't know if you guys have a language lab here. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a language lab either. We have a, no? The idea of a language lab has disappeared. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, that's another topic we'll talk about, you know. <laughs> Because I want a language lab, we don't have one, I guess, you know. <laughs> Claudia said many places do not have one. So that's um, go ahead. Well, Please. simply because we have the we have the web these days, so sometimes um, a lot of what was in the language lab can be accomplished on the web. Not always, mm -hmm. but in these 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 guys at Davidson, for example, use the concept of the language lab to simply practice oral communication. Yep. So they had three or four hours of instruction every week, and then one hour was devoted exclusively to oral communication. And uh, and it worked well, you know, it worked as well as, as um, it was pretty satisfying, the students were satisfied with it. 
Uh, some of the current methods uh, in a community language teaching, content-based approach, culture-based instruction, task-based instruction, PBI is a, uh, that one, there's a lot of research on uh, task-based instruction. And, um, and then, what do they all have in common with respect to grammar? Any, any guesses? No explicit grammar instruction. No explicit grammar instruction, yeah. So maybe this is a new trend, which is, um, you know, I'm not, I, I, I do some research, but I'm, I'm no expert, you know. I know that it's all um, sometimes it's just trends, although we base um, most of what we do on, on, on sound research or sound that can be done in second language repetition. But um, most of them say no explicit grammar instruction at the early stages of acquisition. Of course, at some point in step, we do have to mm -hmm. teach grammar. But teaching grammar in the early stages of language acquisition based on these methods, um, a lot of research has just shown us that it's not necessary. It's not effective. It's not. But even our students, they come to us and they're like, no, it, how do you conjugate this? You know, and they want like they want you to write on the board like all the verbs they've been uh, in, 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 in the past, and, the, and they love verb paradigms. Mm -hmm. And um, but they are not effective. At least that's what research tells us is that um, we do need a lot of inputs. And input eventually becomes intake, which is the ability for your brain to just do it creatively. And, and these paradigms are not necessarily helpful. Um, not necessarily. Uh, they may be helpful when you're thinking, okay, well, what's the importance of the verb and that, you know. But uh, um, anyways, I'm going to talk about communicative language teaching into a little bit more detail. So it's a, it's a communicative approach. So the idea is that, and I'm sure that this is what is used in general in most institutions in academia. Can I ask, uh, we were trying to, I was talking to someone the other day, since maybe the 80s communicative language, like when did this really start to arise? In the 80s, we still had a lot of audiolingualism yeah. as well. Uh, audiolingual methods, and that some research was being done, definitely, yeah. in the 80s, but like I said, a lot of the textbooks don't don't, are not willing to publish yeah, yeah, anything. Yeah. So it was not until the late you know, 90s or uh, late 90s um, and definitely at the beginning of the 90s, that's when it really, um, I mean, we have the natural approach and I'm sure you've all talked, uh, heard about crashing and I'm gonna talk a little bit about crashing and what you brought in. That was, that was in the, definitely the, you know, earlier than that. But a lot was being researched and talked about and it, it was, there were a lot of buzzwords about the natural approach in conferences, but, um, there were different ways of, of approaching it. And, uh, but in communicative language teaching emerged, yes, in the 90s, more effectively in 2004. When I arrived at UNCG in 2004, um, it was really not implemented, you know. Um, I, I, it was not, I was not going to, um, to be the coordinator of languages, but I, I had just finished my dissertation in, in languages, and then I started teaching, I'm like, what are you guys doing here? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and then it eventually I became the director of language instruction. And I'm not saying that I was a savior, I just I just tried to, we started having a lot of uh, forums and I know that um, you came to one of our last language learning series, so we, we had a lot of professional training. Because there was nothing wrong with traditional learning and a lot of, um, I, I, ha I get a lot of, I mean, I know you guys are much more eclectic, uh, uh, international and, and, and diverse, but we get a lot of the local students that are learning languages in the local high schools and, um, and it's still very traditional mm -hmm. and it's still very much drill to it. And so it's not necessarily <coughs> the communicative approach at all. I mean, the book that they use is terrible in the, in the, in the colonies, but, but at least the idea is that the, the, the figure of the, you know, the teacher is not the central figure anymore. So learning happens when you are in a group discussing, negotiating, communicating, and, and, and the teachers are facilitators in this case. So we can help, we can assist, we can counsel, we can present the information, we can provide input or method. And, um, and the, the idea of meaningful interaction is, is very important. Um, and then just some thoughts, you see, Savignon in, in the 84 explained already the communicative competence, it, this is the four underlying competence grammatical competence, discourse competence, sociolinguistic competence, and strategic competence. 
I don't know if you all speak a second, a third, or fourth language. I'm assuming yes. But um, I don't know what your experience has been when you were learning all these other languages. But um, some of these competencies are really difficult. For example, the sociolinguistic competence, something that seems really simple, you know. I, I learned English. My experience with languages was I learned English in, in school in Spain, in a very traditional way. In, uh, in January of 20, I found an opportunity to go to New Hampshire as an assistant counselor. So I immersed myself in New Hampshire in the summer camps um, for nine weeks. And I did it again the following summer. And that's really what I've learned the most in my entire life, those nine weeks. Because I did not speak a word of Spanish. But of course, it wasn't easy. The first couple of weeks, I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to say? And, um, but then, um, um, in this, in this, in this process, my, um, my pronunciation for whatever reason was a little bit better than most Spaniards. Uh, um, and then, um, I ended up studying English and, uh, and ended up coming to the, to the U.S. to be an ASCO for the U.S. And, uh, so my first week, you know, I'm there, they're like, hey, stop by anytime, right? Your friendly neighbors, hey, stop by anytime. <laughs> Of course, I'm Spanish. You know, any time for me means I grab my bottle of wine and second, you know, next Saturday I knock on the door. You know, at like six or seven. Hey, you told me to stop by any time. <laughs> and they looked at me like, you gotta be kidding. You know, <laughs> very quickly did I learn that I had, I might have learned a lot of the two other competencies, but my sociolinguistic competence and my, um, you know, there are a lot of competences that I still had to, um, had to learn. And now we, they try to intersperse those in, in, in books, but it's it's still this is you know these are some of the, the challenging ones, and, and that's why I'm sure that you took your students everywhere in the world. But it's typically what you learn when you go to other um, places. But this is these are one of the first. Um, Sabrina was one of the first trying to write and try to make sense of what was happening in the brain. Uh, what happened also with communicated language too to me is that a lot of the information was being drawn from psycholinguistics as well and from uh, cognitive linguistics. So they were with MRIs and, and we were, uh, you were able to learn at least um, maybe what else was going on in the brain. Maybe how languages were learned, that's why um, they would say, they do have some good things about bilingual learning now and what happens in the brain with bilingual education, why one side of the brain is, not, is mainly used for languages, but with bilingual children, both sides of the brain are used in, uh, are used for languages, and, and they have now research that says that it's good for dementia and uh, to prevent, not good, you know, good to prevent <laughs> dementia and other um, things. But um, so yeah, we use drills, communicative drills, uh, not mechanical dr drills. And um, so there are drills, but they're communicative. So then students can um, can work at expressing, interpreting, and negotiating meaning. Uh, so these are the, the key ones. So, and we'll look at maybe an activity to, to see if we can turn that into a communicative language activity. Um, so basically what research tells us is that communicative language teaching seems to be more effective in the long run and students that use this kind of methodology um, are able to actually use the language outside of the classroom. So, um, but both instructor and learners need some time to adapt to the method. Um, um, we still, like I said, we still have students that refuse to participate in the classroom. They, they come and they want to sit, and they look at you like, no, I, you know, these are the topics. I don't, I don't need to be engaged constantly in this group or study 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 team class. Um, so research tells us that lear learners need much input to be able to process learning. So input is what we're getting. They need influx of input. And then this eventually will make will become intake. In other words, the intake is the ability for the brain to not only, because sometimes, for example, we teach the past. And, uh, and then we teach the past. They take a test on the past. They have an A. But then we ask them to, to we have a communicative activity the following day about the past, and they can't use it. So why is it that they can use it? Well, 
uh, it takes a break sometimes to process that information and to be able to use it to be this output part. So input doesn't become output naturally. So and there's there's some time. Like there's just some time that has to that has to happen between one and the other. And uh, but acquisition definitely happens by way of inputs. So in repeated cycles. And that's why we recycle information as well and because it, it helps in the in the long run. Um, the best way to learn is to have learners do something with the language. So um, So not only to communicate, but to, like I just said, do, do something with this information. Uh, so in the past, students used uh, the second language to practice the drill. And now, um, learning occurs when we are actually using um, the second language to accomplish something or to, to do a thing. And I'm trying to go fast because I'm trying to find something to, that we can do. Um, <coughs> Yes. Excuse me, I have a question there. Learning occurs when the second language is used at all times, even including the beginning of the teaching? Yes. Mm -hmm. Like for example, when I'm teaching Chinese 101, so the researchers suggest that I should speak Chinese all the time. Yes, Chinese um, um, idiographic languages are an exception because students okay. don't have, um, they, don't, they don't have any knowledge whatsoever. So anything that has, so Chinese, mm -hmm. Japanese, and, and a lot of the Asian languages are the exception. Oh, but so languages that are wrote, that are written, like Roman, Roman languages. Yeah. The, when there is a word by word connection, and I know it's not word by word, but then from the very early stages you can use it. In Ch mm -hmm. Chinese is an exception, and, and some okay. of the Arabic languages are also an exception, because right. they, need, they need to know um, something before they can actually use it mm -hmm. in a community. For all the other languages, yes, from day from one, from the lesson. Okay, not, thank you. Not, you have the exception language. Um, <laughs> but you could, but still, um, it's as, as soon as possible. Right. You know, yes. it's, it's the idea to start using it as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, some languages present more, uh, pose more, more challenges than others. Absolutely. Uh, so the activities that we normally find in textbooks are repetition. Form and production, so we go from like, no, this is the grammar, and then we're just going to use it. Um, and there was no context sometimes in vocabulary, so of course, we luckily have to go with this. But um, I'm just going to give you an example now of, um, uh, of an oral activity, for example. So, Igben Maniche, vi bagnel. Igben Maniche, vi bagnel. Adam. Ah, <laughs> hey is Adam. Igbe Mariche, hey is Adam. Yeah. Igbe Mariche, vi bagnel. Ze Virginia. Oh, Igbe Mariche, ze is Virginia. Yeah. Yeah, Igbe Mariche, vi bagnel. Heidel. Oh, Heidel, sorry. Igbe Mariche, hey is Heidel. Ze is Virginia. Hey is Adam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, vi bene. Okay, this is just to serve my, 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 the point of um, this is a very simple exchange where you don't need, um, I mean, this was Dutch, and um, I, I, um, for most of you know, you may know that this was Dutch, and you might have known some Dutch, but uh, you can just, it's, it's a very simple um, activity, but you can work with it. And this is, you know, Dutch 101, uh, where there's absolutely no need to to explain anything. You can just, of course, there's, there is some level of repetition, and there's, but but there's no need to explain. This is a verb, and this is a subject. And again, in ideogra um, ideographic uh, languages are slightly different because there's no sometimes there's there's no parallel, uh, and then there's a little bit different. Another activity, for example. So this is a very typical activity that is um, that you can just start using right away. Um, another activity is eavesdropping. Tell me about eavesdropping. So I I teach Spanish. Spanish is everywhere, luckily for me. 
So the Nikkei Omas do used to go to the Mercadito or to, um, to stores, Mexican restaurants, and I tell them to eat well. And then um, even, if, even their one-on-one students. And then I don't tell them to give me all the information because that's, that's, that's what they want to do. Oh, but I can understand word by word or when they're reading something. It's the same idea. I tell them, you don't have to understand everything. I just want to think of it. I, you know, sometimes a lot of it is just uh, logic or common sense, you know, like how old do you think they were? Because I can set the, 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 the type of conversation that they were having. Uh, oh, where were you when you were eavesdropping? Because it's not the same thing to eavesdrop at a store or, you know, at a sports store or at a grocery store. You know, if you're next to the fruit, you're most likely going to be talking about the fruit or not because you could just be next to the fruit talking about how, you know, your kid is driving you crazy or, you know, you had a car accident. But, uh, but sometimes the context is very helpful. And uh, so, you know, what were they talking about? In general, what do you think that they were talking about and what did they say? And now, uh, this can be done in the, in the real world, but this can also just be done um, by asking them to watch a film in the, in the second language without the subtitles. They always say, oh, no, 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 I need to watch it with subtitles. And, and, and I, you know, I say whatever, whatever you think is gonna help you, but I'm recommending that you, I'm recommending that you do it without because I don't need you to understand everything. And there's gonna come a point, and believe me, there comes a point. Um, and you can do this yourself, whether very you that or not. I don't know if anybody here speaks Danish. You watch a movie in Danish. Eventually, you start getting some words out of it. You do. Because you hear them so many times, and the context helps, and so just like, Vivenia, you know? Eventually, you're like, oh, I get it now. You may not be able to have a conversation in Danish, of course, but that's the first step. And this is what sometimes we don't allow the students to do, is to just let them figure it out by themselves. Because that's that's what we do when we're, you know, when we're one year old and we start saying ma or you know, or da or whatever it is that some kids say longer than others. It's the same thing. It's not, it's not the same process. It's not the same thing. But um, but we don't always feel bound that we have to must learn so much and learn. But but um, sometimes we're not given the opportunities to be adventurous with the language. And this is what the idea I'm trying to give. Um, so I'm just going to maybe read this too. But the idea is to just change any kind of activity. Have an activity, whatever list you have that was in the present, and then you just say, please uh, change it to the past. Most likely, in most languages, you're gonna try to find the verb, and you don't care if you understand the beginning or the end, you're just gonna change the verb, right? And you don't necessarily need the context around it. You need to understand mostly. And um, a very different activity, for example, it just depends on the level. But a different activity is to say, let's organize the trip. And uh, I don't know if, if students may have computers in the classroom or not, uh, but you can just um, make them watch in groups and say, uh, you guys are travel agents. You're gonna choose what country you're gonna go to, and then you're just gonna try to do a seven-day trip, for example. And then take into account that each person has to assume a particular role so one might be the one that likes to skydive, the other one likes to go to museums, and the third one just likes to, um, enjoys the, the gastronomy. So uh, she'll make a trip where these three people are going to be able to enjoy doing this in this particular X country. And, uh, and it could be an activity that you could do in one day or in a week or a project. Uh, but you tell them that they need to use the, the, the second language. And I have done it at all kinds of levels. And, and in Spanish, it has been extremely successful uh, because the students are doing something with the language. And they, they have all kinds of hurdles. And you, the things they say, the things they come out of their mouths, they sometimes, um, it's terrible. But communi <laughs> communicative language teaching also believes that errors are okay. And uh, you know they, we need to make mistakes in order to learn to understand them. So 
I don't correct. I mean, that's another topic, entire topic of conversation. But I don't, I don't correct a lot. I like the really advanced and it's the, it's like a current error because uh, it disrupts the flow of the conversation. So you know, mistakes are are, are okay. But um, so this is what a traditional grammar activity looks like, and um, how can we improve it? Beth, any idea? What can we do to make it just more? Communicative language teaching oriented or more real. Do an interview with someone mm -hmm. else in the class about what they did over uh -huh. the weekend. Mm -hmm. For example. Any other idea? Are we mm -hmm. talking about teaching grammar? Uh, well, we want them to perhaps use the past, you know, no. but instead of just changing or, or doing from, from, uh, from present to past, um, we, we may want to have them use the past. So that might have been what you just marked. You can use it like a, um, have an information gap where students have different sets of information and they have to interact in order to figure out what different people are doing. Like a murder mystery <laughs> with the past going off of that. Yeah, that's cool. I'm glad you asked that. Yeah, a murder mystery. Like, where were you? <laughs> Pictures. Picture. Yeah. It doesn't always have to be oral, it's just communicative language teaching, but it could be writing or it could be listening or it could be viewing something. But yeah, picture. Yeah. Yeah, these are just some ideas, you know, contextualizing just. Starting with either a film or a text or a, a fragment of something instead of just um, you know raw sentences, brainstorming, marking something that is content based. So I mean we've all made submissions about that uh, or team target listening activity, aggressive team target listening activity, follow up with another activity. Um, research tells us that sometimes activities that go in steps or that have different uh, that really helps so we go from like little to big you know you may want to you know uh, you may want them to use the vocab about something and so you start just by using and you give them the vocab they don't have to know everything they can have everything on the, on the board or in the book or whatever so you give them the vocab and you say okay we're going to start little and we're just going to start with um, um, a particular imaginary setting a murder mystery so we have the, the weapons and uh, possible um, assassins, and we have different people, and we have a house haunted. I'm not sure anybody how haunted that is, but it's been, um, <laughs> and then there's uh, the dead cadaver, and I don't know, you know, you you can do anything you want, really. And um, so the first activity could be very basic, you know, what do you think happened, or you know, give me some. It's just an image, and you say, you know, give me some words that happened here. And then the second one is. Um, what was going on before this image? Uh, what's going to happen after? And then you can create your own story. So you can provide the, the, the context of activities and give them some of the activities. Have you found that it's better to scaffold um, over the course? So to begin with, say, listening and then move into um, reading or reading and listening and then written production and then verbal? production, that that kind of scaffolding is good, or is it okay to just dive right in to say output? Uh, uh, what Van Patten and Lee say is to do one thing at a time, okay. normally. So it's better to, if you do, if you do, if you put two things together, then it, it's a little frustrating for the, for, the, for the learners. So it is better to do perhaps just listening, and eventually you can mix them all, but they start small. So. If you wanted to just do the listening activity and then move to the reading, and then it's, it's so scaffolding is, is definitely 
better depending on the level of the students. Some are ready to dive into you know, like more advanced levels, they can do a, a lot of new things, but some are, um, are reluctant to, of course the speaking is always the, the one that they feel that they're more unsure about. Uh, some are really good readers, some are really good listeners, um, uh, most of them don't want to talk too much, but some do talk a lot. In, uh, but like I said, each, um, each develops in a unique way uh, by using it in a, in a, in a meaningful way. <laughs> when they come to me, I you know, I just want to say stuff. Like, you know, <laughs> now that I'm learning, this whole stuff is going to be wastage of money. <laughs> no, no. I mean, any practice. I always say any practice is good, you know. But um, um, the classroom environment is a very helpful environment. And, and students can really learn a lot. And uh, I don't know how many years you have them here or how many semesters they, you know. Uh, we normally, the, what we call the basic language program, it is, is four semesters. Of course, I always assume that they're very good students. So then they read all the readings at home, and they even prepare at home, and they come ready. If you're not ready, then of course, uh, your teaching is not gonna go that smoothly, not at all. But um, you can do it all, much more. Culture-based, uh, so uh, same thing, you know, if, you're, if you are from, uh, uh, if you're teaching French, and you wanna do something related to the, to, to the Caribbean, to the French Caribbean, and, and put them in some sort of a different environment, that can be very helpful. And anything that has to do culture with it, there's, you all know that culture has been uh, modified enormously. And luckily, we've had culture um, included in a more meaningful way in a lot of the textbooks now. So it's not just, uh, I used to really hate when I saw a flamenco dancer in the book <laughs> for Spanish or bull. Yeah. I'm like, really? Nothing else in Spain. Paella, flamenco, dancer, balls. Wow, you know that's what we do. Jamon. Hey, jamon. I mean, it's it's important. Don't get me wrong. The jamon is good too. <laughs> but um, and of course it's part of the culture. But it's you know you know what I mean. So um, luckily, at least now we know there's other stuff. Um, but it just uh, and, and it can be very. It's a it's a factor that can really motivate students. There's a whole new wave of culture-based instruction. So that every, and sometimes, you know, that's my personal view, we need to take everything to the extreme. Everything has to be from the culture. So, and, and you know, everybody can do whatever you, you find uh, that works. You know, and uh, sometimes our old students, everybody learns things differently, we have different. I'm sure that the students at your institution are very different from the students that we have as well. And they may just need something slightly different, or they may be looking for um, we have a, an activity here, so this is, um, so in a communicative language activity, we actually give them the verb instead of telling them to, to use it, so, um, so this is a communicative language speaking activity. We give them the verb and they have to say so, which we think is good, you know, it's the right time. And they can always help, but um, they need to write something that's meaningful rather than let's just focus on what's the past, past tense stuff. Um, it's just another example. This is another traditional activity, you know, write sentences, repeat verbs in the present, blah, blah, blah. So same thing, how can we modify this activity? I'm gonna give you now, I'm gonna let you talk. So this one, because I remember from your class there were three types, there were mechanical, meaningful, and communicative. So the one from before was mechanical, right? Where you just this change. This one is mechanical, yes. But the, yeah, that's mechanical because you just you don't have to know or understand anything. You just change it from present to past. Well, now, this one is actually this one is meaningful because you need to understand the meaning. But no, the no, one no, that no, we no. saw before, the one that before, before. Yeah, I'm sorry, the one yeah, before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But but that one. But now, if you, do you mind going to the next screen? This one. Yeah, but that one there um, is that meaningful? Well, um, it is, but. Um, how, it is meaningful, but how can we make it more communicative? So instead of just saying write sentences with the sentences of these verbs, uh, how can we just modify this activity? And that's why I was just hoping to give you some creative for four minutes, and I'm counting. Me thinking. Or they well, you can work in you know oh, in your own. Sorry. 
Yes, you, you couldn't come up with. Okay, yeah, so for a minute, you can either work in pairs or in a whole table so and sit here. I'm going to walk around. All right, so how to make, yeah, it, make, it, it, more, right. make it more meaningful or even communicative? How, how, how can you modify? Okay. Just modify. What would you do? Speaking, just right? speaking. You know, like yeah. the desk, and they have to ask each other questions, and that's where it gets easier. So, like, if you could fly anywhere right now, where would you fly? Like, if you were doing okay. things then for the conditional or something, right? <laughs> so then. They've got two minutes, and they do that speaking on the line, mm. coming up with questions to ask about that. So when they answer the question, and answer you give you some sort of view yeah. Of so like if I asked you if you could fly anywhere, right? Like you said, oh, I would fly to. I don't know where you would fly. For the uh, now I want to know. <laughs> can think about your method of drawing pictures. Would you draw something quick, like right? say. Then exchange your pictures yeah, to describe the situation. Oh, with the other person in the room. Yeah, I'm drawing that something, awesome. but you had to use yeah. the word to say, so I'm dreaming of eating a big cake or yeah. he's flying in the sky, things like that. It'd be really funny though, because I'm sure they'd get it wrong and say, like, oh, right, he's right. they'd have to crack it to say, no, I'm not really of really tilling. Right, giant right. rock, and you're like, no. But no, but in your, in your it's a big idea. cake. <laughs> but in your activity, it's all in the target language you're saying. All oh yeah. Like, like, like everything you said, like t talk about where you want to fly. Yeah. So you're saying, that, so the, so we're still in a low, no, a pretty I mean, high we level of ability. No, we do that in ability. ten cents in French. Okay, yeah. you so where do you want to? Okay. Yeah, 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 that's a good point. That's a good point, right? We just want to make sure they have the question. Right. Yeah, it just depends on the question. So like we do, I'll do speaking, and you know they introduce themselves so they're revealing some of that and then they might have questions about like what they like to do or where they're going for the weekend we've discovered that or like we had them sitting to each other in class yesterday so they had to you know like come up with these lines and then you know answer them it's like asking teacher so like they have some structure to it but then they end up having Fine, you know, and it's not perfect production, but they're making it easier. And get them ready for those study project trips where they're seducing them. <laughs> Excellent. I'm not having it. No, I'm just thinking. No romance. Well, well, go ahead. No, just bring them into some situations. Yeah. Where it's romance. Yeah, yeah, they don't all have to do it. a way to, to isolate a, some grammatical form and then to make it very simple and to focus on that and make it meaningful. The, the idea here is to get the, to use the verb in the present tense. So I'm trying to think of a way to, a, a meaningful would be where, where like a meaningful word that students will have to do, understand it in order to do something with it. In other words, not just saying, well, how do you go to sleep? Oh, it's on the end. Right. Oh, okay, good job. Mm -hmm. That's mechanical. Well, in other words, they want to, Make it to where they have to attend a meeting to make it in order to do something with it. Yeah. Okay. So but at the same time, you have, uh, I'm sorry, you have to be able to use all the words. So maybe mm -hmm. if that is Chinese on that stage, probably the students cannot speak too many words. Right? Sometimes maybe just focus a little bit more. Just on. Okay, so what, what, you guys, what did you guys yeah. come up with? Like, if, I may, if I may ask a question, yeah. just to share a couple of ideas. You, please. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. 
Any other ideas that you'd like to share? We are uh, one of the things I do in the class would be using pictures. Like we're learning the small words at the very beginning, uh, pair them up, or maybe three students in a group, one student will draw an easy, quick picture, then other students will guess. You know, draw a picture to say someone's flying, so the students will say a superman's flying, or he is flying to the moon. So by using the sentence, but if they guess wrong, the person will correct them to say, no, I am flying to a big cake, things like that. There's a version of that game in English, which is really fun, to kind of like telephone where the meaning gets skewed. Oh yeah, yeah. Draw something and pass it, and that works well. I think for this too. Any other ideas of what to do with this? We talked about just creating a LinkedIn form of question that they can ask and contribute to other classes. Uh huh. Yeah. So these are some of the things that we can do. Excellent. Thank you. Um, now I have a couple of questions for you. Um, do you use the second language in the class? Mm -hmm. yeah. Why or why not? Why do you use the second language in the class? Or I know why you don't in the beginning stages. Mm -hmm. yeah. But what do you guys, 50, 50. so what's the thing? Yes, why do you use it? From the immersion experience. Uh -huh. the immersion to be exposed to the language. Yeah. Exposed. To shower them with the input of their target language, like, uh -huh. we, like you mentioned already. Where else are they going to hear the language? Where else are they going to hear the language? That's mm -hmm. my point. Like, it's not like, please explain this to me. It's in the book. <laughs> you know, why, why you, do you want me to explain something that's in the book? Mm. Read it, you know? Well, it helps um, them become resourceful um, and to think about problem solving and to listen to cues. Uh -huh. If you're only speaking in the language the whole time, you know, they're, they have to be active and engaged in trying to figure out, you know, what's happening. Even if they don't know all the words, it doesn't matter, but it, it helps teach some of those learning skills that we want them to have. Yeah. Well, in your experience, what works better? In terms of grammar. Anxiety. Yeah. Anxiety, right? Yeah. Yeah, anxiety is important in second language acquisition. So there's lots of research that says that, you know, low levels of anxiety help in learning. High levels of anxiety completely interfere. And that's why there's the, the link in sure, four ounces of wine helps. More than <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Only four ounces of wine. <laughs> because four ounces. Of course we're not gonna go to our students and say, hey, have a beer before you come to class to lower your anxiety. No. But it, but it is true that sometimes it's the idea of the anxiety. You know, sometimes we can create the atmosphere in the class and just, um, you know, where you make yourself uh, the first. You just, I laugh at myself all the time, and I, I, I ridicule myself. I don't know. And uh, to just try to ease the situation. But for some, some will never relax, and you can see them. You know, they're tense the whole time. They're there, and you ask them a question, and they sweat, <laughs> and their hands are like, you know, and. and you know, and, and it doesn't it does it doesn't really um, help. But yeah, with grammar, what what uh, current research tells us about grammar is that uh, you know it's it's controversial. But uh, but um, what it tells us is at the initial stages, it, at the initial stages especially, and this is kind of going from French to you know first semester, second semester, even fourth semester, what, all that intermediate um, grammar explanations are really not needed in a class, especially because books we have fantastic web sources, we have things that tell you everything. We have videos with these ladies with glasses, they always have glasses. Yeah. <laughs> and they're always like, they give you an explanation with the blackboard and blah, 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 in English, you know. So, for all languages. So, why do I have to do the same thing that's on the video if there's so many resources? In? And if you go to YouTube, oh my gosh, there's so many guys out there that teach you everything. Where's the songs? 
with a guitar. I'm using that note with the guitar has mm -hmm. a song for everything. Yeah. So for every language. So um, really, do I have to do? Say, no. There's just no need for me to spend wonderful time that I can just be trying to provide um, input to my students doing something something else. And I know they have a question. Yeah. It, so it was about um, the grammar thing or the homework um, that you were assigned. So I had, um, you know, like the first few years that I was teaching, I would assign you know, what we covered that day for homework. And then um, Dr. Leclerc, who couldn't be here, she teaches probably all in English and probably was just having them memorize uh. dates in his history class. <laughs> he turned the recorder off for that, right? Um, <laughs> he, um, off the record got me to assign what we would be covering in class the night before. So they would be the grammar, so like the future or the new vocab or whatever before coming to class, um, which makes them really nervous and they don't like to do, but um, it's been helpful. So is there, I don't know, do other people do it before class? Do they do like homework as review? We try to implement the pre classroom yes yeah. um, so the theory the grammar um, they stay at home with those beautiful videos that they can mm. watch yeah. tutorials and uh, use some vocabulary and then they come uh, just ready to use the language oh, and give really things to the language yeah, that's, the that's the theory I thought you already got students that's that's well. <laughs> this is it it's not, that's the theory but in practice mm. they, I mean maybe a third of the class yeah, I kind of feel like you had to give yeah. them a quiz, a test. If I don't do yeah. that, they <laughs> just simply don't. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's fine. One thing I do is, is that we've talked about this before, me, but I'll, like, we do have the tutorials in my Spanish lab. We use gente. I know you guys have used gente some, but we use gente, and it has my Spanish lab. And, you know, there are tutorials you can assign. And, and, you know, it can be a joke. Maybe they just click it and don't even watch it. But, but what I'll do is I'll assign tutorials before the class and I'll give them a couple of simple homework assignments in my Spanish lab and I'll give them unlimited attempts. I mean, if, if you can't watch a yeah. tutorial with unlimited attempts and make 100 on that, but it's at the end of the day, if they don't do it, they don't do it. And then hopefully, ideally, they come in and we can just use that time for practicing. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it seems like we have the restraints of like limited time here in the class, we have to give tests, and then we have students, maybe they can go complain, maybe in, I know, I'm, you know, let's be honest, I mean, for me, I'm afraid of getting a lot of, a lot of bad student evaluations. So I'm, I'm, I'm just saying there's the reality, that's the reality, so there's this. So anyway, I try not to give too many grammar explanations, but I know in Gente, if you start at the front of the chapter, I mean, it's a headache. So I will, at the start of the chapter, I'll take a little bit of time, and I'll just point at the base page, and I'll say, by the way, look, here's the grammar for this chapter. Yeah. And I'll just kind of point at it and talk about it for a minute. And I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, but it feels like, I feel like I'm kind of covering my back a little bit by doing that. Yeah, I um, students students put a lot of pressure on us too, and then they always say, "Maybe it's your duty to teach me," you know, or, or I think you need to. I don't understand it. You explain it to me, and I always say, "I'm happy to explain everything to you in office hours." Mm -hmm. uh, but next time, I'm not going to spend 15 minutes here uh, when you know we're in the middle of a classroom. Like most of the other spirits are are doing well, and it's something that uh, I mean, teachers do have some hiccups here and there, and uh, and I try to use. Time a little bit more effectively. I'm going to walk you through some givens. Really, I know that you, um, you know, we're on the. Um, I don't want to overwhelm you, and like I said, I have a lot of information. But at least I'm just going to give you some givens of second language interpretation. These are just some uh, research-based um, information um, that uh, you might find helpful. And then I have some crash information as well, but it's very general, so I'll, I'll walk you through it too. But um, you tell me where to stop. Um, but um, esta ley second language interpretation does involve the creation of implicit unconscious language system. We have no access to that. We can manipulate the language, and that's why input is the best teacher we can do. But it has to ha it, ha it happens differently in every um, with every learner. Then the rules uh, of syntax lie outside the awareness of this implicit system. So um, they do different things in a different way. They they arrive at syntax in different ways. Uh, input is fundamental in uh, in language means in meaning bearing. So uh, input is also related to meaning. I just gave you input. Crashes, what for the input hypothesis? Remember, 
I'll talk a little bit about that in, in the term settings. But comprehensible input, cost effectiveness. And comprehensible input is just a bit of the, the whole I plus one. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just information that is a little bit above. If it's at the same level, they're not going to learn. If it's below it, they're not going to learn. If it's I plus seven, they're not going to learn. So just a little bit above. And, and there's a lot of truth in, in this claim still.